questions that I get asked frequently is, how do you go about articulating a skeleton? Well, there are three things that you really need. Springs, rods, and a tap and die set. Of course, there's a few other little details in there. Uh, but what you're about to see is not necessarily a how-to video. It's a description of a lion skeleton articulation that I did several years ago at, uh, at a gallery. Um, However, after you watch the little video, hopefully it will spark some questions, and if you actually do want to go through this process, then I will scroll my little email address across the screen, and you are more than welcome to uh, ask me questions at any time, and I have a very good track record of getting back to people. So, without further ado, Panthera Leo. Take 
you can take the thorax and like the neck and uh, the end of the thorax and bend it in a complete C, like all the way around, up and down because of the spring blinking. Um, knees are pretty self-explanatory, pretty simple hinge there, but then, then the patella is uh, sprung loaded there. Any questions on the line? I was just talking to him about line, everybody shut up. So that's cool. <laughs> Sternum actually generally has about one inch of cartilage in between each section, whereas ours, you know, you just have this. Yeah, pretty much fused. Um, so, so in order for lions and kitties to be able to do that, that full, complete, like weird contortionist thing they do, <laughs> this is all completely segmented with, with pure cartilage about one inch in between each section, and then the cartilage joining in the centers here, attaching to the ribs, um, all of it completely flexible. So long as a cat can fit the, uh, you know, the, the ends of the zygomatic, zygomatic through any surface, they can fit their entire body through, through, through stressing, which humans can't do. But uh, that's another reason for the lack of, of uh, real significant clavicles. Um, again, there's no, there's no real bone attachments towards, towards the, uh, the scapulas. Now, a lion does have clavicles, but they're only about that long. And in cats, they're only about that long. They're just slivers in, in between tendons. Professor. <laughs> yes. Why does the spine of the scapula bisect the body of the scapula on a lion as opposed to being like two-thirds up on a human? It's a thing from, from what I'm gathering. I mean, obviously, they're, they're built for the, the quadrupedic motion, but, but also for, for um, abilities of, of lunging forward. They, they can't really dislocate so much. Like, like it allows them to be able to, to lunge at great distances the with the scapula. Right about at the, the seventh thoracic. And um, it's really, really, really hard to, to figure out how scapulas are working on, on cats because they are unlike any other animal because of the flexibility. Dogs have more of a sternum um, than, than cats do. Where did you a lion carcass? This lion in particular comes from a, a, a zoo from uh, Minnesota that it died of old age, which is, there's a, there's a lot of reconstruction on these canines since they were worn down and basically did the quick. Um, so they were built back up on, on some of them. Some of them are all the way down. But um, died of old age and was sent to a taxidermist to have it made into a rug. And so the remainder of it went to me because nobody else uh, <laughs> wanted to buy it. I got lucky and then we got find the lion skeleton in raw form. And when I'm saying raw, I mean raw. Like, like this, this required weeks of, of cleaning. It, this is, this originally would have been about, about a, kind of a brownish gray. It's what we would call a rough skeleton. So they have to be dermistead beetle cleaned. They have to be peroxided. Uh, in, in a very weak solution in order to not disturb the calcium itself. And eventually we end up with a nice pretty white, white, white line. But that requires gallons of chemicals to do that and a lot of time for dermistats to do their job. Um, so from then, at that point, then you take the disarticulated mess and you start arranging it into the proper, the proper structure. One thing you'll notice is that the bones will only go together in one way. They, they don't like being positioned wrong. So, if you take your time, you'll be able to articulate any skeleton, no matter no matter how intricate, because they all fit together in only one way. You can force them in any different type of way you want to. Now, you can turn this into a complete chimera and turn it into a dragon if you want, but <laughs> but it won't fit right. And that's that's where the jointing comes. Like, like all these, these um, little processes up here that have felt in between them, like they, they will only fit together solidly in one way. And so then you just start start memorizing exactly what that way is, and then if things are wrong, you replace it, you put it back until it fits absolutely back. Is that the largest animal you've worked with? I guess technically so. I mean, the largest in skeleton, yeah. I mean, everything has its 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 amounts of awkwardness, like the. The train fully extended on the peacock is 11 feet. Uh, this is 9 feet. Mm -hmm. 
but but in sheer volume, yeah. But I will also say that it's easier, a little more expensive, and possibly a little more time consuming. It's easier to work on something like this than trying to do the same thing on a cat because it's big. You know, it's like trying to put a puzzle together in which the pieces are only like that big. You know, when you have them that big, you can actually see them and, and be able to drill into them. A cat is very difficult. I've got a kitten that I'm working on too, in the same way, stringing up the spine. It's a lot easier because you have just a piece of thread that you can wind through there. But it's a lot harder in the fact that you can't get screws into, into any of the bones. It's just too tiny and, and anything you do, your clumsy fingers just smash things. And so, possibly difficult in an overall application, but, but really a lot easier in trying to do this exact same process on something like a possum. <laughs> Any other questions? This is fun. <laughs> What's your background? Social service. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been messing with dead animals since I was a kid. I was a kid that had a wing collection as an eight year old that my parents never found. Otherwise, they probably would have told me about it. It's 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 yeah, it's been a lot of the, the love of nature and and just how things work. I mean, when you actually do the fact that we can actually make comparisons between an animal like this and ourselves, like when we're talking about the seven cervical vertebrae as being that knob, it's amazing. Uh, the, the, the type of unification there actually is, the comparative anatomy between something like a lion and human, which is why I really wanted the lion, because it's kind of human size. You know, a lot of the long bones are, are about similar size to human. And so you can really start to, you, you place things together, like the, this skull, look at this, I mean, they have the same openings for, for nerves and for vessels that the human does. There's, there's some dramatic changes, which is mostly right here and, uh, and, and right there. And the scapula in the pelvis that allows us to walk upright and do so naturally, and for a quadruped to be pretty happy hanging out on all fours. But even, even in those specializations, you look at the details of the pelvis here and the pelvis on a human, and they're remarkably similar. And so working on things like this allows me to have better appreciation for the anatomy of a human too. With specific specializations, such as retractable claws in cats, not on dogs. It's just kind of that, that neat thing to be able to look at that kind of godlike template and, and see those, those similarities and start to understand a bit more of what it is to create the physics of, of anatomical kinetic motion. Which is why I want these things to be able to be movable in anatomical conditions. It's not necessarily so I can demonstrate them, but so I can understand them in the first place. So, what'd you think? Pretty nice, huh? All right, well, as promised, uh, my email is jeremyjohnson888 at gmail.com. Um, if you want to give this a go and have any particular questions or just want to chat a bit about bones, because I kind of like that too, then give me an email and, uh, and let's get the communication started. My work is all about education, and uh, I want people to start doing more of this. So, email away. Anytime. I have nothing going on tonight. I mean, I'm free, so. <clears throat> hmm. Something shiny.